Good morning. It's really good to be here. <laughs> I, uh, I really haven't heard a lot of your stories, but uh, I, I know we've had a fairly common experience among us, although I did talk to a few people who didn't even lose power. And I'm, uh, I'm thrilled with that because for several days, I didn't know anyone who had power <laughs> anywhere in any part of my life. So uh, it was, it was a rough, rough week for some. Lucinda and I had the privilege with our daughter Sarah of attending the uh, Road Fest on Friday night. Uh, her son Thaden is uh, part of the company that construct, designed and constructed a lot of the set work and uh, assembled it, and they're there to make sure nothing breaks and fix it. Uh, him and his dad are part of a pretty large crew, and uh, we're, we're real proud of what we were able to see. I trust if you go, you will enjoy it as well. That was meant to go on the road and go all up and down Route 66. I don't know if AAA will stick with it on that or not, but we'll, we'll have to see. Twenty twenty six will be the hundredth anniversary, right? So that was, you know, we're hopeful. Uh, Friday night was a little light, you know. A lot of people still didn't have power. Uh, the most, most of the parking lot at uh, the fairgrounds was trucks, <laughs> boom trucks and uh, tree trucks that uh, were off duty at that hour and are coming in and. Uh, it was, you know, it's been a different week, certainly a, a, a difficult time for them. We've been uh, looking at a series called The Kingdom of Heaven, and I'm using the term heaven from the book of Matthew because that's uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew's chosen choice instead of the term kingdom of God that Mark and Luke and even John use. Um, also, it calls with the term calls the image of heaven coming down to earth. And the idea of that is that uh, Jesus' prayer was that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if, if we just operated the way heaven operated, things would be a lot better. Who can disagree with that? <laughs> that, that seems to be universally applicable. And uh, one of the the struggles I think we have as Christians is we live in a world that constantly wants to redefine everything, wants to give a new term for everything. And nine times out of ten, they'll use a term that means something different to us and in fact takes away some of the message because it's been redefined in the culture. And that'll be a struggle we'll have to deal with from now on. It is not unlike Jesus' struggle at all. Uh, so one of the things that Jesus had to do when he came to the earth as, as the Father's son, uh, he came with the real message, but he was talking to people who, who didn't believe that message. They didn't see it that way. He was trying, in fact, to redefine their view of God's reign on the earth, and uh, they were unwilling to hear him. And so his method, many times, was parables, and and the way he would begin a parable is with this phrase, which I'll use as the theme of our lesson today. What is it like? What is the kingdom like? Well, the kingdom of heaven is like this or that. You might remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nicodemus came to see Jesus. And Jesus told Nicodemus, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, that is much more uh, descriptive of the reality than, than I think we've realized as we've read that passage. Seeing the kingdom is the success of seeing it for what it is or the failure to see as it is. And, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, who thinks, I've got it made, I'm, I mean, I'm a leader, I'm a ruler among the Jews, I'm the teacher of Israel, Jesus will call him. Um, no one could do these things unless he came from God, but, you know, uh, I'm having some trouble understanding. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, you're having trouble seeing. This is the problem, and let's work on that. So Jesus, in his uh, method, if you will, uh, Matthew chapter 9, 
says that he was going through all the cities and villages. This, this was a road tour. He was teaching in their synagogues. He was proclaiming. He was announcing. He was describing the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom. And healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So it had with uh, the message, the confirmation that he clearly had power beyond others and anyone that they had ever seen. And we described that in our first lesson. He presented himself as king. And Matthew describes for two chapters uh, just event after event after event, intervention, healing, uh, raising from the dead, cleansing a leper, uh, handling things that just, who can do that? Who can do that? How do you explain this person unless you attribute to him what he claims that he is? So Nicodemus says, uh, uh, we, know, we know a couple of things. Uh, number one, you're from God. And he says, no one could do these things that you're doing unless God was with him. So the idea is uh, God sent him and God came with him. Now that, that's a word picture. That's a way of seeing who Jesus is. Jesus is the one sent, but he is the one who contains or is the incarnation of the Heavenly Father. And so God is with him and in him. That's part of the message that we'll look at today as he talks about the kingdom in parables. Now the, the chief chapter for this is actually Matthew chapter 13. Uh, there, there are chapters as well in Mark and Luke and uh, different sections. But Matthew 13 has a list of parables in it, one after another. And, and it's interesting that crowds are beginning to gather. And Jesus, in this case, got into a boat and sat down. And the idea being, as, as the kind of the amphitheater goes down to the water... And he sits up on a boat and he can get the sound out to the larger crowd. <clears throat> so the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, here's one. Behold, the sower went out to sow. And he, as he sowed, some seeds fell by the road and birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depths of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others, he said, fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, here's, here's the part about seeing. So if you have eyes and you can see, if you have ears and you can hear, and then this parable is going to explain really what that process looks like. It's important that we see the kingdom for what it is. And again, I want to remind us that, that the people that Jesus was speaking to thought they knew, and so they, were, they had a tendency to kind of complete his sentences before he would finish, but say the wrong thing, because <laughs> they weren't with him. Uh, they didn't understand and they were, trying to, they were trying to complete the picture in the way they wanted to see it and not in the way he was trying to say it. So his, his message is something, when we're, when we're talking about the kingdom, it is something that is very different from what you are, are thinking. Uh, this, this is a problem for us today. We live in a divided, uh, controversial Religious climate, in fact, a good majority of the world is pretty anti-religion and speaks of religion, especially using that word in negative terms as if it's something to be avoided and, and kept away from me. Uh, I don't, I'm not interested in hearing it. There's nothing you can say that would have any interest for me. And that's not terribly unlike the Roman world when Jesus is walking the roads and, and going to these towns and villages. So he goes and he does some things very differently, and it causes people to gather and say, well, this is not the same old thing. 
So let's listen to what he's saying. Now, in uh, verse, verses 10 through 12, the disciples uh, asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And so Jesus' answer is, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. So uh, his explanation to the disciples is, is, the, is his description of the dilemma that he's facing. Yes, crowds are following, but there are four kinds of hearers in the crowd. There, there are different soils that are receiving this wonderful seed of the kingdom, the word of God. And it's not, it's not penetrating in equal ways. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the description that Jesus gives to describe this, but I'm mostly going to list it for you as opposed to read these verses. This begins in verse 18 of chapter 13. He says, Hear then the parable of the sower. This is the key verse, I think. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. Now, his, his description here puts characters in the story. We have a kingdom, we have a sower, and we have an evil one. And what happens, the evil one is not a bird that, that came and ate the seed. That's the, that's the parable, that's the story. The description, the meaning is the evil one is the devil. Who when someone hears the word, but, but it, they, they don't understand, so it doesn't go in. It's just kind of laying on the top of their head, like a seed on the path. Very descriptive. The lack of understanding keeps them from acting on what they've been taught. And so as he goes through the four soils, here's, here's the list of the obstacles that can occur. Besides failure to understand, which is the first one, the second one represents affliction or persecution, he says. Affliction or persecution can keep the seed from really germinating. It germinates, but it, but it has no root, so it, it really can't survive the heat of affliction or persecution. The thorns choke away the seed because that represents the worries of the world or the deceitfulness of wealth. And we could add the deceitfulness of, of any sin, for that matter, but wealth is, is a very common one. We think, uh, as Lucian was talking this morning in the class, you know, sometimes people uh, try to explain where they're not using God's will and God's principles for living by explaining, well, this is business. You know, that's that part of my life. And, you know, the Christian part of my life, well, that's, that's for my spirituality. Well, well, Jesus is saying it's, it's just dirt, and it either goes in and produces fruit or it's worthless. I mean, there's, there's no sections of your life. There are kinds of soil, but you can only be one at a time. So pick it, and pick it well. Uh, the, the right response, the good soil, is soil that hears, understands, and bears fruit, reacts, responds, does something continues to do something. I don't know about you, but when I went out in my garden this week, you know, we missed a lot of those storms in the sense of rain. I had to, I had to turn the watering on, you know. And it was getting pretty hard out there. And, and my knowledge is that if I don't water this, then what has grown up will die. I don't have a garden because I planted a garden. I have a garden because I take care of a garden. And so it, it's got to, in order to bear fruit, this is a continual process. And the kingdom isn't a one-time entry. And this was the Jews' issue. Well, we were born in the kingdom, so we're it. We're in. 
There's nothing that can happen that's going to change that. Jesus says, not so. Let's talk about rocks and thorns. and There's a lot of things. Persecutions, worries, deceitfulness. There are things that could happen. Now, in this process, to put these two passages together, Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to see. The parable says there are some who they hear and they understand. They actually see. They have eyes and they're able to see. And what happens when they see is they're, they're willing to receive the word. They're willing to hear it and understand it and act on it for what it is. And he describes these people as those who have. And so they're going to gain more. He's going to tell several parables about that, like the talents. When you have understanding, you can gain more understanding and more wisdom, and you can see it deeper as you continue to work the garden, if you will. So those who receive the word have the word, and these are the ones, he says, who will enter. They're born of the water and the Spirit, to use the analogy in John chapter 3. They, they've acted on the reception of the Word. They understand. Now, there's a whole string of parables that follow. I'll, I'll go through these somewhat quickly. For instance, the next one is, the kingdom of heaven may be compared, this is verse 24, compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. This is a weed that looks like wheat. And they went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, you can't tell that there's two kinds of seed in the soil until it comes up. Then the tares became evident also. And so the workers in the field said, well, you know, let's, let's go tear out the weeds. Let's go weed the garden. And Jesus says, no. This is different. The kingdom isn't like your first inclination. While you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So a picture of uh, the judgment day, of what will happen at the end of time. Uh, we've all been in the field together, the good and the bad, the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds. And, and God makes the separation at the, at the time of judgment. And that's how he explains that. He says it'll, do, it'll be the angels that do the gathering and uh, that take care of that issue as he explains this, this parable. Uh, we look at life and we say, well, you know, why does God allow evil to continue? Well, you know, if, if you... If you go into a room where there's a shooter and you just start mowing down whatever's standing up, yeah, you'll get the shooter, but you'll do his work for him too. That's no way to do it. You've got to act like, wait a minute, let's do this in a different way. Let's start over. Let's be born again. Let's think of this in a way different from the natural reaction to just go take care of something right now. The next parable is the kingdom of the or the parable of the mustard seed. I'll show you a few pictures with these. It's like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. It's smaller than all other seeds. Now, that's that's kind of a generic statement, okay? There might be a smaller seed. But here's what you need to understand. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Those are deer in the foreground. And that is a mustard tree in Palestine. Jesus says, you take this little bitty seed and that's what you can have. And that's the way the kingdom is. And this is one of the problems. They, they think the Messiah is going to come back and there's going to be a big parade and there's going to be a big to-do and everyone's going to realize what's going on. In fact, there will be a war and there will be blood and there will be... The enemies that are all dead and only us will be remaining. 
Jesus said, no, it's more like a seed that grows a tree. Uh, just, just, just erase what you think you know about this and come back to what I'm trying to tell you. This is a, this is a construction, a growing project, not a dis- destruction process. Verse 44, he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It's hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It's, it's of great value. It's something that everybody else walks by and they don't see the treasure. But the person who found the treasure hides it so that he can go make arrangements to own it. And when he sells everything, now he can own the treasure. And that's the way the kingdom is, Jesus says. Here's here's the list just from chapter 13. I haven't described all of these. The wheat and the weeds we we talked about. The small seed, of course, the mustard seed that produces great plants. In between there is the the leaven that's put in a lump of dough, and then the, the dough rises. One little bit of leaven changes everything that it touches. That's what the kingdom is like. The treasure that's hidden in a field, and then he followed that with a pearl that is of great value. Again, someone that's willing to sell everything they have just to own this one pearl because this one object is the treasure. And that's what the kingdom is. It's worth everything we think we know, everything we think we need to do. All of it can go away, and we can give it all to God because His will and His way are all that matters. His final uh, parable, at least in that set, is of a a dragnet that you go out to, to fish, and you catch all kinds of fish in the net, but not all kinds of fish are edible. Right? So especially if you're going to go to market, you need to remove the ones that no one wants to buy or eat. And you need to separate the good from the bad. And and that, of course, reminds us of the weeds going back to the top. Here's the one that I think, uh, and I don't even know if you remember this one. Verse 52 in this chapter, Jesus talks about scribes who become disciples. That... The kingdom of heaven, when a scribe becomes a disciple, is like the head of a household who brings out his treasure. And in his treasure are things that are new and things that are old. That's a 100-year-old silver dollar there. Um, it's all, those are all dollars. A couple of them are actually shiny. Your treasure has things in it. And Jesus reminded them I know you think you know everything already. But some of the treasures that you own are are shiny new. And you need to value them as certainly as much as you value your old and your traditions and your way of always doing things. In fact, he's already explained, you probably need to sell all that and put it all into the new. But he's trying to get through to them. You don't understand just because you think you do. The term enter, I showed you this slide a few weeks ago and I've added to it because it, all of the four things that are used in passages that describe entering the kingdom. The first was to Nicodemus. If you want to enter the kingdom, you must be born again. And we, we went through that passage quite at length in John chapter 3, looked at the verse of water and the Spirit and the way that passage was used in other places to see that Jesus is commanding that people be baptized. And in that moment, he's talking specifically of John's baptism. You know, you didn't want to go out and be baptized by John, but you should have been because that was God's will and you should do it. I did it. And you you need to do that, Nicodemus. That was the first thing he was telling him. Of course, it went on through the New Testament, being taught for all people. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not going to be enough for you to say, Lord, Lord. You can know who I am. You can call me by the right name. But if you do not do the will of my Father in heaven, your words are worthless. So a professing Christian is only part of the story. You must humble yourself as a child. The the disciples at that moment were actually arguing about who's the greatest. Oh, that's helpful. Who's the greatest? Jesus said, "Um, let's... Start over. 
Let, let's, let's be born again. Let, let, let's think about this in a totally different way. He brings a child and says, now this is, this is what kingdom is like. You become like this, and now we can talk. And they're like, they're like thinking, well, I'm smart and I'm powerful and I'm, I'm, I'm worth a lot to you. And Jesus is saying, not until you become like this. Until you're like a child, you really aren't worth a lot in the kingdom. And then his last uh, description of entering the kingdom, and he actually, as he talked to the disciples, he's the one that injected this word enter about the, the uh, rich young ruler. And, and how... A, a person who says, oh, you know, there's surely one good thing that I, that I can do that, that will give me eternal life. And, and Jesus says, well, start with the commandments. That might be a good place to start. And, and the ruler says, well, I've done all that. So Jesus looked at him and it says, and he loved him. It's important. I'm, I love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. What's standing between you and eternal life is your wealth. Sell what you have and give it to the poor and come enjoy treasure. And he went away sorrowful. As Jesus went away sorrowful. Because wealth is something that can keep you from seeing the kingdom. Wealth and a whole lot more, that's why I put it in parenthesis. There are a lot of things in this world that are distracting and that keep us from the kingdom. Let's look at these conclusions this morning. We started with this term C, and I think that's the, uh, that's the key. I mentioned uh, the parable of the sower. The key verse is, is the, the on-the-path seed that can't germinate because a person hears but doesn't understand. Have you been troubled this month as we have been troubled You know, I, I, I hate to even use these two words in a sentence together. Because we're in Pride Month. You know, I'd just like to celebrate Father's Day. Just one day. <laughs> Nobody gets a month. <laughs> but, but how is it being, how, how are we doing? Two groups of people with signs screaming at each other. Has anybody noticed that no one's listening? Because no one's listening. And so you can hear something, but if it doesn't go in, then you're going to keep having the mess you've got. And that's just something we've really got to understand. This is the way our world is. And that's why it's broken. And that's why the Son of God comes down and He says, you know, you really need to listen to me. Jesus is baptized Heaven opens, the Spirit descends as a dove, and God says, hear Him. Peter and, and James and John are up on the mountain, and here's Moses. He finally made it to the promised land. He's standing on the mountain there in Israel with Elijah, who was supposed to come before the Messiah came. And they're like, well, let's, let's build three tabernacles. And... A voice from heaven says, this is my son, listen to him. And they were so afraid, they, they bowed down low on the earth, and when they looked up, there was just one left. Jesus is the one that knows the way out of our mess. And that includes pride. I know it's, a tr it's an issue that troubles a lot of people. But we've got to listen to Jesus for the answer to that. Secondly, if you want to enter, you have to accept God's reality. <laughs> Number one, He is the creator. He designed everything as it is. When we use His creation in a way that doesn't honor His design, it breaks, it tears up, it, it causes all kinds of problems. We get all smart and we tell uh, our experts to find a solution for us and then we put all of our eggs in that one solution and we tear up something else. You know, it, we're not as smart as we think we are. If you haven't noticed that. God's reality is the real reality. But God's reality isn't the world's way of looking at things. 
It is a spiritual reality. And we need to understand that when we try to speak kingdom to a world that doesn't know God's reality, they can't hear us. They can't understand. Paul said in Corinthians, these things are spiritually appraised. And someone who's not spiritual, they just they can't understand. And so we need to accept God's reality, and then we need to use God's reality as we share, speaking the words as we were told to speak them, and doing the good works and bearing the fruit that we were told to bear, so that hearers can hear. It's very, very important. That's the foundation of our moving forward ministry. Thirdly, Lucian mentioned this in his class this morning. Uh, there are many today who say, uh, once, once you're in, you're always in. There's, there's no getting out. Well, none of the parables indicate that. Uh, there are obstacles. Even just the parable of sower, just take that by itself. There are four kinds of soil, and three of them will not get you into the kingdom. It, it's, they're going to keep you out of the kingdom. And, and the other parables say the same thing. That's why the angels have to come and separate the good from the bad in so many of the parables. <laughs> because just because you say, Lord, Lord, just because you say, well, I want to be a Christian, just because you say, well, I want to do what's right, that doesn't mean you're ready to actually bear the fruit and understand and follow through and live the life. And you cannot do that on your own power. So you're going to need kingdom power for that. There are obstacles that exist that will keep people out of the kingdom. It is a sad reality that the majority of those who hear, let alone those who don't hear, all of those, the majority of those who hear the good news of the kingdom will be lost. Those were some of Jesus' first words. It's a narrow gate. It's a straight gate. It's a narrow way. And few are going to make it all the way that's what we're going to talk about next week, the inheriting of the kingdom. Finally arriving, finally being there where it can't be removed. There are so many things that can keep us away. And we've got to recognize that and understand that, especially as parents as we raise our children. And finally, entering the kingdom can be a temporary experience. Remember that in the parables of the soil, the seed germinates in two of the three bad soils. The seed does germinate. One, because of rocks and lack of root, it doesn't survive. And the other, because thorns choke it out. Apparently, a healthy plant gets choked out because of the thorns, because of the deceitfulness of wealth and uh, worries of the world. So, this is one of the hardest things I think we deal with. We look at one another and we say, isn't it wonderful to have everyone here? Folks, I'm telling you, I've been in ministry for decades. And there are a lot of faces that are not in these pews. That were. And we thought they were solid. And it grieves me to think that could still be true even of this group today. There would be some who don't make it. Because of all the things we've talked about, the obstacles and the cares and the worries and the deceitfulness. This is for keeps. And life in the kingdom can be temporary. And no one wants a treasure that's temporary. I mean, let me read two passages that I really say a lot just in their reading. Having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming... This is late in Jesus' ministry. He answered and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. We're going to talk about that more next week. There's three ways to translate in your midst. One is within you. But the term your is plural. So he's talking to the group. And the idea is, it is among you. It is in the group. But again, 
There's not group salvation. There are groups of individuals who hear and understand and bear fruit. And so Jesus is telling this group of Pharisees who will not listen to him, who will not submit to John's baptism, who, will, who are trying to kill him, as a matter of fact. The kingdom is right here, and you're missing it. You're not seeing it. You're not understanding it. You're not obeying. You're not being born again. You're trying to kill me, and yet it is, you could reach out and touch it. It's in your midst. This is why Paul says it in Romans 14. Therefore, do not let for what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. And he's talking about different kinds of food. And people arguing about, can you eat that or not that? <laughs> he says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not your correct view of some doctrine. I'm sorry. I don't care if you're talking about baptism. I don't care if you're talking about anything that we consider sacred. If there's not righteousness and peace and joy in a heart, the kingdom has not arrived. Because that's the kingdom, according to Paul, teaching what Jesus taught. We're going to finish this next week, and I trust that it will be even clearer. I hope this has been helpful for you. We pause at this moment because we invite you to respond. Because the whole definition of kingdom is we don't just hear things, we understand and we make a response. And so if it's a place in your life where a response is required, in other words, you've not responded, you've not accepted the word as it has entered your life, you've not been born again, you've, you're tentative, you're waiting, you're, you're trying to see how it turns out, whatever the reasons are, response is required. And we give you that opportunity now because we invite you to take advantage of it. You're in an atmosphere of love and support. And there'll be nothing but joy because of your response. Will you come while we stand and sing?